William Walker was an American that dreamed of running his own South American country, and he did it. Well, for almost a year at least. Walker, born in 1824 in Nashville, Tennessee, he graduated with a law degree at the age of 14 and a medical degree at 19. He moved around after that, editing and co-owning a newspaper in New Orleans, and in 1849, he moved to San Francisco to edit a paper there. He fought three duels, lost at least one, was wounded a few times, and by 1853, he'd gotten the idea in his head that he needed to establish a colony in northern Mexico. But when he approached the Mexican government, they said no and so instead, he decided to go filibustering. Ah, filibustering from the Spanish filibustero, which is rooted in Dutch, but we're sticking to the Spanish here, and it means pirate or robber. More specifically, filibusteros were often Spanish pirates that attacked coastal cities, so more or less, we're talking land pirates. Filibusters were land pirates. The actual definition is a person engaging in unauthorized warfare against a foreign country, but yeah, land pirates. They were also called free Booters. So, Walker was able to round up a force of 45 land pirates, and in late 1853, they captured the city of La Paz, which just happened to be the capital of Baja California, and Walker claimed it as his own territory and established it as the Republic of Lower California with himself as president. In addition, he also set the rules of the Republic to be the same as Louisiana, meaning that slavery was legal. And that there, folks and folkettes, was the point. It wasn't about ruling his his own country, he wanted to establish a republic with slavery, then join the United States as a slave state. He saw that Texas had done something similar back in 1845, and this was his plan. About three months later, he annexed, yeah, using air quotes here, the state of Sonora from Mexico, and this was completely on paper and in Walker's head. And with together with his existing territory, he created the Republic of Sonora. Not long after, Mexico finally had enough of this foolish gringo land pirate, and his band of freebooters and ran them out of the country. Walker would then be arrested back in California because, yeah, it seems that trying to start a war with another country is illegal, specifically under the Neutrality Act of 1794. But what Walker was doing down in Old Mexico was rather popular with the folks back in San Fran. Manifest Destiny was kind of a big thing back then, who knew? And he was ultimately acquitted by the jury. And now we get to the fun part. In the 1800s, Nicaragua was very important to shipping. See, they didn't have the Panama Canal yet, so in order to ship from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa, you had exactly two options. Option A, sail all the way down here around the bottom of South America, either through the Strait of Magellan or the much more dangerous Cape Horn and back up, which of course took a lot of time, or B. B, use a combination of river and lake sailing and stagecoaches to get it across Nicaragua. And whoever controlled that route through Nicaragua was a rather powerful feller, and at that time, that feller was Cornelius Vanderbilt. We'll get back to him. And of course, wouldn't you know it, in 1854, civil war broke out in Nicaragua. You had the conservative or legitimist party based out of Grenada and the liberal or democratic party based out of Lyon. Those are cities if I wasn't clear on that. And the leader of the democratic party, Francisco Castellon, had heard about old Willie Walker and invited him to bring as many as 300 colonists on down to Nicaragua and establish a colony. And by establish a colony, he meant go land pirate and yep Walker ended up doing more filibustering than a Frank Capra senator. He headed out of San Fran in May 1855 with between 45 and 60 men. He picked up another 100, 110 or so locals after they landed. His army was known as the Phalange, which means phalanx. And on June 29, 1855, they fought the first battle of Rivas. Basically, Walker had the natives stay back to cover the rear. He and his troops went in, holed up in some houses to rest, killed 70 enemies, wounded at least the same number, and eventually Actually, a teacher named This was able to set one of the houses on fire. He became a national hero, but Walker and his men were able to escape. Even though he lost the battle, he gained a lot of support and volunteers started streaming in to join him. In September, he won the Battle of La Virgen rather handily and enlistment increased even more. And in October 1855, he took the city of Grenada, effectively taking control of the country. He ruled through a puppet president and his regime was acknowledged by 
by U.S. President Franklin Pierce as the legitimate government. But Walker had made some enemies. Costa Rica was very iffy on Walker and what his plans were as it pertained to expanding his territory. And then you had Cornelius Vanderbilt. Yeah, he's back. Who was no longer in control of the shipping route through Nicaragua, so he sent a few men, and more than a few dollars, down to Costa Rica to see what they could do about this whole pickle they'd found themselves in. The Costa Rican army moved to the Nicaraguan border, and seeing what was coming in March 1856, Walker sent 240 men, a mixture of Americans, French, and Germans, to preemptively attack Costa Rica. It resulted in a loss for Walker at the Battle of Santa Rosa on March 20th, and in April, he lost at the Second Battle of Revis, or Revis, or Revis, or however you say it, I find all different types of pronunciations. But this time, his building was set on fire by Juan Santa Maria. And before he left, he had his men throw dead bodies into the wells, which contaminated the water supply and led to a cholera outbreak that killed about 10% of Costa Rica's population. In July, Walker held a rigged election and became president. He also made slavery legal again and English the official language. About six days later, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala all signed a treaty of alliance as they saw Walker as a threat to be dealt with. So in September, the Allied Army, known as the Septentrion Army, defeated Walker's men at San Jacinto. Not that San Jacinto, yes, that San Jacinto. And around the end of the year, beginning of the next year, Walker abandoned Grenada and ordered the city destroyed behind him. And by destroyed, we mean completely leveled. By spring 1857, Walker was on the run, and on May 1st, he surrendered to the U.S. Navy, who just sent him back to America, where he was hailed as a hero, at least until he blamed his failure on the U.S. Navy. He tried to return to keep the fight going, but the U.S. Navy caught him and sent him back home. In 1860, he published an account of his exploits in Nicaragua and was contacted by British colonists who wanted his help in dealing with Honduras. He was caught again en route, this time by the Royal Navy, who, rather than send him back home to the U.S. again, instead handed him over to the Honduran government, who then tried Walker and on September 12, 1860, executed him by firing squad. He was 36 years old, by the way. Oh, and he might be the most famous filibuster to take on Mexico, but he wasn't the only one. In 1857, Henry Crabb led an expedition to Sonora of about 85 men. But when they arrived, they were defeated at the Battle of Caborca, and the 50 50 men that survived were all executed by Mexican forces. It's known as the Crab Massacre. I guess that puts a new meaning to the phrase deadliest catch, don't it? <laughs> 